Let the meltdown begin. MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network. I am Gabriel Morenci. Let's do this thing. We're going to hell and back with Vince Pichel as Vince Pichel is fighting UFC 173 on May 24th. We check in with Vince Pichel in Los Angeles, California. We're all about the California theme this evening as Loretta Hunt, SportsIllustrated.com MMA columnist as well as New York Times bestselling author. Loretta Hunt will join us and we'll talk a little bit about the RFA debacle and disgrace and embarrassment from this past uh, Friday night. UFC on Fox 11 this Saturday in Orlando and Morency and Black Free Roll is up and running again thanks to the good people over at Counter Move. We got $1,000 cash that's going to be split up amongst the winners. We'll remind you about that a little bit later on in the show. And we got some wicked, and I mean wicked, videos of the week this week. All that and more on tonight's MMA Meltdown. MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network continues. I am Gabriel Morenci. Uh, let's uh, bring in a man who's going to be throwing it down on Memorial Day weekend in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's UFC 173 on May 24th. And uh, this is going to be a sick fight, actually. Two dudes that are going to go in uh, to the octagon with bad intentions. We're now joined by Vince Pachel. We're going hell to hell and back this evening on MMA Meltdown. Vince, welcome to the program. How you doing, man? What's up, Gabe? Good, man. How you doing? Hey, we're doing good, man. Uh, we're doing good. Uh, you know, we're stoked to get you on the show uh, here, although I'm not so stoked uh, because I've always butchered your opponent's last name with Anthony Enju Kawani. And, you know, that's as close, as, that's as, close as I've ever gotten uh, to this. But, you know, I, I mess up the last name Jones, uh, Vince. So, you know, whatever. There's, <laughs> there's so many freaking Russian dudes like Khabib Nagurdabenov and all these other guys. I just go by their first names, man, you know? <laughs> Don't worry, man. It happens with the best of us. <laughs> <laughs> so, in all seriousness, it's a pretty good fight for you. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again right now. You know, you're judged by who your friends are in this world in which we live. And if you're a fighter, you're judged by who your opponents are. You can be a guy with a 17-0 and record, but if people don't respect the guys that you beat, the 17-0 and record, you know, doesn't mean jack shit, for lack of a better term. And, you know, you, you fought some tough guys, and, uh, and Anthony's a tough guy, man. You know, he's a tough guy. He's got a lot of cage experience. He's been in there against some tough fighters. Um, what did you think when uh, Silva called with the matchup? Um, I thought right away, oh, that would be a good test for my striking. Um, he's a good technical striker, you know, no doubt there. Um, but he, he's a, he's, honestly, my work is kind of a one-trick pony. He's, he's got striking, that's about it. Um, so I think it's a good fight for me. Um, I think I'll be able to get in there, get in his face, and bully him. Uh, I'm not going to be afraid of his power. I don't, honestly don't think he has too much power behind his, uh, behind his technique. Um, but, you know, when I throw at him, I'm going to be throwing power. So it's going to be a good, good match of uh, technique versus power. And as you stated, he's a good technical striker, but he seems to take chances, doesn't he? In which, you know, he'll try the spinning back fist. He'll try, you know, some crazy roundhouse kick. He seems, you know, he's exciting to watch, but he does still take a lot of chances. Do you see that when you watch his fights? Do you see holes? Because when guys, you know, guys try that stuff, spinning back fist don't always work out good for the guy that tried it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do actually see some good holes. Um, one thing that I do see is, is basically his lack of respect for his opponents. I mean, he's a good technical striker, and, and given that, you know, you, you always need to respect your opponents. And the one thing I see from him is he just doesn't respect guys like he should. Uh, for instance, when he was fighting uh, Edson Barbosa, you know, Edson Barbosa's uh, no slouch striking. He's a good striker, too. And, and you could tell Andrew Kwani fighting that fight, he was kind of just, just throwing whatever. Like, he didn't really respect Barbosa too much. And, and Barbosa caught him a couple times, watched him a couple times, and, you know, had those shots been a little, a little, uh, little better landing or landing a little cleaner, and probably would have knocked him out. So uh, that was one thing definitely that I saw that I'm going to be able to take advantage of with this guy, him just underestimating me and, me and uh, not, not showing um, not kind of showing the respect that he should with, with someone especially like me. 
Now, you were on The Ultimate Fighter. Uh, I guess it was season 15 uh, that you were on. But after, after you got injured, man, you tore your bicep. And if I had biceps, I, I guess I'd know what it's like. But, man, that, that sounds like an awful injury and compared to other injuries. Like, I've had my nose broken. I've broken my foot before. You know, I've spent a lot of time in the hospital over the years doing stupid things. But I've heard, like, muscle tears are just the freaking worst. How bad was it? Yeah, it was it was honestly really bad. Um, my my bicep got split basically all the way down. Didn't tear completely. It was just basically split in half. So the doctor had to cut it. And, you know, do do some uh, cosmetic surgery, I guess you could say, with with my bicep and reattach it to my bone. Um, at first, it just felt kind of hopeless, man. Like you know, after having surgery, I don't know if you have surgery or not. But as soon as you get that surgery, it's kind of like, shit. What am I gonna do? Am I gonna be able to do this still? Like, am I am I gonna be okay? Am I gonna come back 100%? Am I gonna come back not 100%? You know, a lot goes through your mind, and, you know, a lot of doubts, definitely. And, and you know, as the weeks progress and physical therapy and going on, and, you know, you get a little bit of hope here and there, and, and um, you know, eventually you're, you're done with it. And it's like, wow, I totally forgot I even had surgery, you know what I mean? And and now I feel like I got to I gotta work my right arm around to catch up my left arm sometimes because my left arm just, I worked on it so much that, you know, that, that thing is not getting hurt again. I'm, I'm making sure of that. You know, I think you got one of the coolest uh, names in the business uh, with the hell and back. So I'll use this this cliched line in which, you know, idle time is the devil's time, isn't it? And I've always been fascinated by fighters in which a lot of people think you know, fighters are jarheads or they're just fighters. But a lot of fighters are pretty self-analytical about their own life. And especially when they're injured about their own career. And when you're not fighting, if you're a fighter, you got to be in the gym. You got to be going through the process. Uh, I imagine it must have been pretty tough, right? The mind starts wandering and it just sort of sucks, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, a, a lot goes through your mind. A lot, of, a lot of things that you never would think before, you know what I mean? Like, what am I going to do? Do I have a backup plan? Am, am I going to, you know, how am I going to make money? How am I going to pay my bills? Like, those are the things that run through my mind. Um, I couldn't even lift a plate of food for like four months on my left arm, so you know that that was kind of discouraging in its own. And and me not being able to to basically do things like that was it sucked, man. It really sucks. And I was on my my legs were okay, so I was able to run and and work my legs out and stuff. So I, I did a little bit of that to keep myself occupied. But so it's 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 another experience. If if you've never had experience, uh, um, surgery and, and you go through it for the first time and it's something pretty major, I mean, it t it takes a toll on you emotionally and and. It's hard sometimes to push yourself through that and get back, but, you know, we as fighters, we, we have that extra little uh, tick. And I'm not saying a lot of people don't, but fighters have that extra little mindset where it's like, this isn't going to slow me down. I'm going to keep pushing. I'm going to keep going. And, and, you know, that's that's the kind of spirit I have. I'm not going to let anything slow me down. I'm not going to let anyone tell me, you can't do this anymore. Maybe you should stop. You know, I'm, I'm going to go against the grain all I can. Now, I know you grew up in a tough neighborhood, uh, Canoga Park. I used to live in Los Angeles uh, in the late 80s. My roommates uh, were from Baldwin Park. And, and yeah, I, know, I know the area. I, I know how, you know how the everyday life is. And especially for a young kid growing up there, it's tough to stay out of trouble. Uh, growing up, um, you know, did you say, you know what, I want to be a fighter? Or did you sort of say one of those, um, one of those classic, you know, fighting sort of saved you and kept you out of trouble type of deals? Um, honestly, a little bit of both. Uh, when I was younger, you know, I was super inspired by, like, the Rocky movies and, and Bloodsport, as corny as those movies are now, just when I watch them. <laughs> but those are the movies that really, like, got, got me into wanting to be a fighter. And I was my mom, like, hey, let me take some karate let me get some fighting this and that because i was just inspired by it. my mom's like yeah right screw you you know, you know i'm not paying some hospital bills for you screwing up some kid you know beating up some kid so that, that was my mom's that was my mom's answer to, to get me into fighting young and yeah right i grew up i mean i wasn't even allowed to go outside a lot of times because it's so bad i think i was on the news you know back before the internet i was on the news like think two three times just for shootings people getting killed in, in the apartment complex i lived in and one night, I actually like kind of woke up and witnessed, you know, one one of the things happening where uh, there's like five or six gang centers and you know they're just shooting in the windows randomly in, in the apartment buildings, and uh, an old lady got killed that night. So just and, you know, just stupid things like that. So I, I wasn't allowed to to really go outside much, and if I was, it was right outside our window. You know, if I if my mom couldn't see me from the living room window, then. I'll get my ass kicked. <laughs> Vince Pichel uh, kicking it with us. Uh, living in the real world. And, you know, we had Joseph Valentelli, uh, Valtellini on the program a couple of weeks ago, one of the best kickboxers. 
uh, in the world. He's in glory. He's ranked, uh, you know, second in the world uh, right now. And he talked about how blood sport, you know, was a big, big influence on his life. And I asked him about Frank Dukes. And he said, I don't know uh, about Frank Dukes. I don't know if it's the real deal. And I've always been fascinated uh, by that because so many fighters, so many fighters have been influenced uh, by blood sport. Yet so many people are saying the whole thing's a lie. It never happened. That the inspiration is fake. Which you know, I'm thinking, well, don't tell that to the thousands of people that you know are now fighting and that were inspired uh, by that. What have you heard about that? Dave, do you believe the Frank Duke story is a real one? Honestly, I didn't. I didn't really know, and I didn't really think about that too much. But I mean, real or not, people use what they're going to use to inspire themselves. I mean. Think about how many things in, in life that, that people see, like in the movies. I mean, of course it's a movie and not everything's going to be real in a movie. And, and when you're a kid, you don't know that. You're just kind of like, wow, this, this is so awesome, the things that he's doing. You know, John Conn Van Damme, like the, the things that, the techniques that he was doing and how he was just knocking guys out. Like when you're a kid, you see that kind of stuff and you're like, damn, I want to do that. That's going to be me when I, do, when I grow up, you know? And, you know, now that I'm older and, and I see it, I'm kind of like, oh, this, like, I watched the movie, like I said, it's super corny now. Like, I'm like, holy crap, how did I just love this? But, <laughs> you know, pe people find things in, in everything in this world to, to inspire themselves, whether it's real or not. And, you know, that, that's, that's what makes it, that's what makes it special to that individual person is, is how you take things and, and how you perceive it and what you use it for. You know, Vince, I, I think I was like the only kid and I was, I was a youngster, obviously when Rocky came out of the theaters as well. And I think I was the only one, I was actually cheering for Apollo Creed to beat Rocky. <laughs> you know, I was like, come on. Was, <laughs> I was like, this Rocky guy wouldn't beat the champ, man. You know, he's off the streets of Philadelphia. Like, I, I guess I was just always a skeptic. Instead of being inspired, I was skeptical by the Rocky story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny is uh, when uh, when I was younger, me and my brother we used to like we used to um we used to have boxing gloves when I was like I was like fourteen or fifteen, and and we would just be punching on each other, you know what I mean? And we'd always I'd always be like I'm Rocky and you're Apollo, and, and that's the way it's gonna be, you know, and you get your ass kicked, and you know like we used to always be in the front grass just beating up on each other and stuff. So you know that that kind of thing is pretty cool, just the camaraderie between between that and and things that you could use, but. I'm always one to root for the bad guys, too, in certain movies, you know, because, you know, what, what's this world without a bad guy? You, you need bad guys sometimes. They make, they make everything go around. No, you're right. I, I, I hear exactly where you're going with that. I wanted to see Bane beat Batman up, actually, in the last Batman uh, movie. So uh, I, I get where you're going with that, going for the bad guy. You mentioned boxing. Uh, was it all, you'd start taking karate and blood sports. So was, was, was boxing ever in the back of your mind to, to get into boxing? Or was MMA and the, the entire mixed martial art aspect of it more intriguing to you? When I got a little older, I was kind of like, yeah, cool. boxing would be cool, and I love boxing, but it, like, honestly, it was just resources. Like, I wasn't able to, to do it when I was younger. And, and when I was younger, I was on a you know, and I didn't graduate high school. I barely graduated high school maybe like three, three, four years ago. So, you know, when I didn't really go to school much, and, and in my school days, you know, that was when I was, I was kind of a delinquent kid. I was always getting in fights. You know, I started doing drugs and stuff. I got mixed in with the wrong people. And I did that for a lot of my, my school years. So that kind of took over a good, you know, five to seven years of my life. And I actually didn't get into fighting until I was uh, 26. Yeah, about, about seven years ago is when I got into fighting. So, you know, I kind of, when I went in, I just kind of jumped in, you know, both feet first and, and just started straight doing MMA. And, and to this day, you know, I, I think uh, Mark the Bear Smith, because he's the one that, that got me in there because... Um, I used to be, like I said, I was a punk kid. I got arrested a lot for fighting. Like, I got arrested a lot. And, you know, he he, uh, he used to um, always kind of pick on me, and I'm like, all right, fat boy. I was, I was small back then. I think I was, like, 140, 150. And, uh, you know, I'm always like, all right, fat boy. Like, one day I'm going to be shut up, you know. And he's like, you little backyard baller. He's like, you ain't tough, you know. Go to, go to this gym. We'll see how tough you are fighting guys that actually fight that know what they're doing. And here I am. I've been doing it ever since. And, it's pretty crazy. Did Were you getting your ass kicked? Because uh, I've seen that before, in which guys come off the street, and maybe they're great street fighters. Maybe, you know, they grew up, you know, they're gangbangers. But when you, you get into you get into a, a fundamental guy, a guy that does it, well, was it a learning curve for you at first going, man, you know what, these straight guys are kicking my ass, and it's pissing me off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not going to lie. The first year to a year and a half of me training, I was just getting my ass handed to me every day just getting just getting my ass kicked and 
And, you know, slowly but surely, inch by inch, I would start getting better and better. And the guys that are with my ass, I, I started, uh, I started, you know, landing shots on them. I started doing good against them where eventually I was better than them. And, you know, fighting is like anything else in, in life where, you know, any other kind of sport where if you want to get better, you got to deal with guys that are better than you. And to this day, I still get, I still get beat down sometimes in the gym, you know, by, by even smaller guys that are just super, super technical, super strong guys. Um, and, and that's what I like to do is I like to surround myself with guys that are better than me to, to better myself because, you know, being big fish is cool and all, but you don't learn from that. You, you learn um, from people that are better than you and, and sometimes getting your ass kicked, so to speak. So we'll wrap it up uh, with, so now you've had a couple of fights. So you went through the, t- the TV experience. You've had a couple of fights in the octagon uh, now. Unfortunately, you, you had to take a year off. Uh, but do you feel do you feel more comfortable now, or the nerves a little bit more settled? Do you feel more comfortable going into the octagon now? Yeah, I do. Um, my first fight when I lost to Kavalov, um, honestly, I felt a little unprepared for that fight. I, afterwards, you know, I'm like, I was totally unprepared for that fight. I didn't have any nerves that fight. I just kind of was like, whatever, I'm going to fight this guy. And, and, you know, I go in there, I'm going to kick this dude's ass, you know, no sweat. So I kind of underestimated him and, and didn't really come, you know, totally prepared and, my last fight uh, with Garrett Wiley, I mean, that fight actually I got some nerves, and, and I was prepared for that fight, but I still got the nerves. Um, but you don't know. Um, when, when I'm when I'm about to get ready for a fight, when I'm in the back, you know, I'm okay. When I'm uh, when I'm standing there and, and I'm waiting to, to walk out, basically, before I hear my entrance music, that's when I get the nerves, and, you know, I just feel heavy. My arms feel heavy, my legs feel heavy, I feel slow. <laughs> I guess I, that, I that's that, that moment. Up, you know? That's that moment, right? When when Bert Bert Watson tells you, uh, "Go." When you walk in, that's when you yep, know it's real, rolling. huh? You rolling. <laughs> that's when you know it's real. Yeah. I've always thought it'd be the moment when Buffer's standing there. Does it feel like it takes forever? Because you know you get the walk, and then there's the process, and Buffer announces the names. Does that moment, like you're standing there, because it's only probably like 60 seconds or something like that. But as somebody that bets on fights, sometimes I'm nervous. I'm like, man, this is taking forever. Start the fight. Does it does it move in slow motion, or is it going by fast when you're waiting when you're waiting to touch gloves and do it? Honestly, it goes by kind of fast because well, once I'm in that cage and it locks, I, I basically clear my mind out. You know, I, I talk to myself a little bit, tell myself, you know, it's it's, it's time to be vicious, it's time to be brutal, it's time to be me. Um, time to show this guy that, that he, he took the wrong fight and, and make him regret the fight he, that he took. And, you know, when I hear all that stuff, you know, I'm, I'm kind of just blank down. I don't really hear anything until Bruce Buffer actually calls my name. And then, and then you know, my, my hair stands up. I get that adrenaline rush, and, and my blood starts to boil. It's time to go. So, for the most part, no, I don't, I, you know, it's kind of just, you know, it all goes by so fast. It's kind of like just a, it's kind of like a car accident, like, Everything's so slow, but so fast at the same time. You just, you know, you see everything in little details or what's been happening in your mind when you fight. Uh, Vince Pichel uh, with us. He takes on uh, Anthony Njokawani on uh, May 24th, Las Vegas, Nevada. It's UFC 173. Hey, Vince, we wish you the best of luck as uh, you wrap up uh, your camp uh, for the fight. And uh, love to get you back on the show after the fight, uh, man. Thanks a lot for taking the time to be with us. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Me too. I had a good time. Thanks for having me. Uh, I love more than nothing, nothing else than to be back on the show with you guys. Uh, there's Vince uh, to hell and back, Pachelle, uh, with us. And I sincerely mean that. I really enjoyed uh, the conversation and his sincere honesty. I'd like to get to, to know fighters, what drives them, uh, you know, how they got to where they are, and what it's like actually fighting inside of the octagon. Is These guys are humans. You know, they've, I've spoken to fighters before, and they tell me that, no, I don't like getting punched in the face. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, man, you really got a chin. He's like, yeah, it sucked. He goes, I hate getting punched in the face. I really try not to. I think we forget these guys are just dudes who are fighting. They're not machines. They're not robots. They're just guys who are fighting in the octagon. And some guys throw up before fights. Some guys get nervous. Some guys get scared. Some guys just want to rip people's heads off. And uh, that's the beauty of the sport, isn't it? MMA meltdown of the Fight Network continues. MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network continues. Unfortunately, Joey Odessa will not be joining us uh, this evening. Uh, 
uh, you know, unfortunately had something to attend to right before the taping, uh, which really, really sucks because the show's just not the same without Joey, and there's a ton of great fights on Saturday night. But that's why you've got to tune in to MMA Meltdown Radio. Sirius XM Channel 167. Joey Odessa was on the radio program breaking down all these fights. Now, we had a really, uh, I think we had somewhat of a sophisticated conversation uh, with Loretta Hunt. So in the true nature of the sophistication of uh, tonight's edition of MMA Meltdown, let's continue to be sophisticated and uh, watch a video that is titled Mexican Dwarf Fight Club. Make it stop, man. Make it stop. Now I know what Jerry Springer must feel like. We're going straight to hell in a handbasket. We're going straight to hell in a handbasket. I want to thank uh, Sarge uh, from the Fight Network for uh, tuning me into this video. He's going to hell in a handbasket, too. I think, the, I think we hit a new low on this show. Like, you know, we're talking sophisticated about concussion issues with Loretta Hunt. Did the, did the in-house announcer kick one of the fighters? <laughs> I did. He, 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 started, he gave him like a little shove. Hey, come on. You, you, you have to tear these guys apart after. I'm going to hell. I'm going to hell in a handbasket for this one. That might be the sleaziest freaking video that we've ever played on this show. But you know what? It was pretty good, wasn't it? <laughs> you know, normally I talk over the videos. I couldn't. I was speechless. Uh, what, what can I say? What, what can you say to that? All right, so uh, we're talking about RFA not being very safe. Well, this is how they did it in Brazil, 1997. Here's Vanderlei Silva in 1997, bare knuckle fighting, man. <laughs> got busted up headbutting the guy. I think he headbutted him. That's, that's insane. I, I, I want to watch that whole fight. I, I want to watch that whole fight. And that fight was like 20 minutes. Uh, Vanderlei Silva was 20 years old then. It's amazing how Vanderlei looks the same except for his new nose. It's insane. He was 20 years old there. That was some crazy ass stuff right there. And thanks to, uh, thanks to Lazy the Savage and the guys over at Middle Easy for finding that one. Uh, this last uh, video of the week, we found ourselves, actually, and 
Uh, you know, these videos are great, from the, 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 the dwarfs to, to Vanderlei Silva headbutting people <laughs> in a bare knuckle brawl, to this last video, in which I never thought we'd have Mexican midgets, bare knuckle uh, fighting, and a children's theater workshop, all on the same program. But here's a little theater's children workshop. Sorry, somebody else fighting. They're teaching fire safety. Look at these kids. Ow. Dear God, man. Oh, he is the job. Oh, great, we need you. For real. Oh, God. My God. That's not like, there's a big freaking thick piece of wood, man. Jerk off firemen, you're teaching safety. Think about these kids. Think about these kids watching this. Like that's like, I, honestly, like it's like a house falling on your face, man. Can we play it one more time? I, I, it's unorthodox. I just want to see this guy get hit in the face one more time. Can we get it in there one more time if it's possible? Look at the kids in the front row. Oh, God! Oh, he is the job. Oh, great, we need you. For real? I can watch that. I could watch that 333 times in a row. I really could. Like, that, like that's lawsuit type of stuff, man. I'm calling Jackie Childs and Lionel Hutz. Hey, Lionel, I, I think we got a case here, man. <laughs> We're suing a local fire department. Uh, sorry, Ari, we got firemen to watch this show, Toronto Fire Department, guys. You guys do a great job, because I know there's a lot of stupid uh, dumbasses in Toronto setting themselves on fire, but this fireman, for all right, I don't even know what to say anymore. We, we, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, your MMA meltdown continues. <music> MMA meltdown on the Fight Network continues. Uh, thanks to uh, Vince Pichel for uh, joining us. Really enjoyed the conversation uh, with Vince. Sounds like a great guy. We wish him the best of luck. Now, it's been too long since uh, we've had this woman on the program, a New York uh, Times best-selling author, now currently working on her third offering. And I'm really looking forward to her third book uh, because I love the Justin Wren story, former MMA fighter, now literally and figuratively saving slaves, the pygmy uh, slaves, in the Republic of Congo, one of the most dangerous uh, territories on the face of the planet. And this should be a really interesting uh, read. Loretta Hunt joins us. Loretta, it's always a pleasure. How you doing? I'm good, Gabe. How are you? We're doing great, uh, Loretta. And, you know, um, I enjoyed the, the piece that you wrote about the RFA uh, debacle, but let's get to that in a moment. When I say enjoyed it, it was a near tragic moment. So, you know, enjoyment in the context of the piece. But before we do, um, Justin Wren. Now, Justin Wren's been on the program in the past. I had him on in his fighting days, but I reconnected with him due to your last article that you wrote about him. But it was a great piece uh, that you wrote. And uh, it's a great story that Justin uh, Wren, the Justin Wren story is a great story, how he changed his own life and turned his own life around, but how he's impacting other people's lives. And last time we had him on the program, the guys from uh, Fight for Something uh, merchandising uh, fight company out of British Columbia in Canada watched the uh, watched the piece. They were so inspired by the piece, they ended up donating the proceeds to their T-shirt sales for two months to Justin uh, Red and the foundation. They hooked up with Jet Justin. I know they've uh, they've done some work uh, together, and it's nice to see Loretta. You know, you write a piece. I see the piece, it touches me, we get Justin on, it touches people out there and t-shirt makers. It's a domino effect and it's nice to see that, you know, these stories don't always fall on deaf ears. Yeah, no, absolutely. Actually, that money 
that the company gave to uh, Justin's foundation, Fight for the Forgotten, it's called. It's going to good use right now. Justin was just able to complete his first water well for the Imbatu pygmy slaves that he uh, that that uh, had just been freed and and put on land that they had purchased. Uh, so uh, things are moving really, really well down the Congo, and he's achieving all these goals that he wanted to. But the water well was the crucial thing to get things going. They don't have any clean water and uh, get malaria and, and other uh, waterborne diseases, and that, that kills most of the Mbatu pygmy slaves. Yeah, and I don't think people actually realize with the pygmy slaves either in that the conditions are tough for everybody, you know, besides the 0, 0.1%, you know, the elite. But conditions are tough for everybody. But the pygmy slaves have it even worse uh, than everybody else in an already hellish-like conditions. And you know, it's, it's, it, it gets to me, man. Uh, the story you know, inspired me. And so, you, you know, you wrote about Randy Couture. You've written about Big John McCarthy. This is a little bit different. Is, what's the, pro, the, the approach that's different in writing this book? Because it's a more serious subject matter. Not that, you know, Randy Couture and Big John McCarthy aren't, but this is just something a little bit more humanitarian and, and different, isn't it, in, in what you've written before, Loretta? It's not a typical biography here. Oh, yeah, no, it's, uh, it, it does have a biographical element to it. Um, Justin's only 26 years old, but he's done a lot of living, and we do talk about his life, uh, be, you know, uh, growing up, being bullied, becoming a drug addict, having depression, making it onto the ultimate fighter, you know, hiding drugs as he walked into the house, so, some outrageous stuff. But, you know, that background helps us to understand why he made such a connection with these people halfway out around the world that are bullied in their own right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. It, it is more of a humanitarian uh, book, uh, it, and it's actually a, a Christian book. Justin is um, a, a Christian, and um, he's actually a Christian speaker now, motivational speaker. I mean, so uh, part of the book is going to have that element to it as well. So it's uh, it's an interesting challenge for me. Um, right now, I, I, I'm trying to study up on my Congo history. It's a, it's a very war-torn country that has had issues dating back hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, so it's a, it's a big project, as, as is all of the books I've done. Yeah, I guess so. But, um, uh, it's, it's been really uh, rewarding already so far. As you stated, because that, that's why I asked you that. There's so many different angles here in which you're not just writing about Justin Wren, you're writing about Justin Wren, but you've got to know about the subject that you're writing about, which is Congo and the history of Congo. It's not really, you know, so tell us about, you know, tell us about, uh, you know, the time you fought Tito Ortiz, right? And tell us about, you know, what it was like struggling as a fighter. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to this. Now, at the best of times, Loretta, it can take upwards of what, like two years to write a book. How long, what's the time frame for this? That's a good question. Uh, let's see. We started. We sold the book. With the, I'd say uh, August, mid-August, and began working on it right away because Justin was leaving for the Congo for a year in August. So I basically accelerated the, the period where I gain, I gather as much information as I can from the subject. We did massive telephone call interviews. He came out and stayed with me for ten days. Uh, we just loaded in, and then he left in October. Uh, and since then, we've had pretty good um, communication. He has his cell phone works when he's, you know, out of the jungle and in the towns. He goes out into the towns, and they have to get supplies, and they've, you know, they've had to pick up other people that are involved in the water well work and things like that. So, you know, he'll call me and he'll be, he'll say, "Oh, I'm on a 10-hour trip right now to go pick up, you know, people to work on the water well." <laughs> so he goes, "I'll have a few minutes, and we'll talk, and the phone will go out, and you know." It's it's challenging, but uh, let's say we started working on it, um, you know, mid-August. He left in October. Uh, the book will be due, uh, the manuscript due November 1st, and then I know they want to uh, publish it sometime in 2015. I don't think we have a set date yet, but my guess would be mid-2015 it will come out. So what is that? That's uh, about a year and a half, right? 
Yeah, nothing. Be a little bit more. Nothing happens overnight. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a long, long drawn out process. All right, so listen, we're going to take a quick break uh, here on the Fight Network. Uh, we're going to come back. We're going to talk about uh, the RFA uh, situation that happened this past Friday night in Cheyenne, uh, Wyoming. And you can check out the piece at si.com if you want to get some context to this. Uh, but we also have some video of it uh, as well. MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network continues. MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network continues, as does our conversation with Loretta Hunt. Now, there's there's a lot of stuff going on right now. As a sports fan and as a fight fan, and especially this past Friday night, you know, we had the Bellator, Bellator card uh, going on, and um, you know, I did not see the RFA event uh, live. And I was actually doing a podcast uh, when it happened, but right away, you know, I saw Twitter started to blow up. My chat room during my podcast started to blow up. And people were like, I can't believe what I just saw happen at RFA. And for those of you that are unaware, as I mentioned, uh, Loretta Hunt uh, wrote a story about this. And it was a great piece, uh, Loretta, in which she brought in, you know, as you stated, what should have happened and what did happen. And what amazes me is just how the system failed at so many levels. It's inexcusable that so many people would let this happen. And so Matt Manzanares is fighting uh, Junior uh, Marinhouse, and there's a triangle choke near the end of the round. Uh, Marinhouse survives the, the triangle choke, goes to the corner, falls off the stool, face plants, and basically his corner sort of kicks him and, hey, get up, come on, man. And he's allowed to continue to fight. Uh, it's, it's just mind uh, numbing to me that this would allow to happen. And you know, this, yes, it's RFA, and RFA is a respected company, and this is on Access TV. This is Mark Cuban's company we're talking about here. Loretta, I just can't believe that in 2014 that this stuff happens. Yeah, no, it's 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 a great reminder and a great lesson for all of us that you know there's there is a system out there with mixed martial arts, you know, set up around these fighters to protect them and. Just like you said, you know, there, there were all these checks and balances, and they all failed all at once. And, you know, this guy shouldn't have been allowed. The fight should have been stopped immediately. Uh, but, you know, all these people that were supposed to do that, the referee who saw him fall and, and walked over and did everything except help him get up, <laughs> you know, <laughs> watched the cornerman pick the guy up and put him back on the stool, stood in front of the fighter, and then did nothing. So I'd ask, his, ask the corner if they, you know, if they were okay. Um, that was pretty outrageous. Uh, the doctor obviously, you know, failing to, to come in and check him. Even if he missed the, the fall, which is possible if the doctor was cage side and, you know, making notes or whatever or talking to someone during the, the round. So, I mean, the, the, those were two key characters that failed, but the commission failed. You know, there are people sitting cage side at the tables, you know, making sure there's a supervisor that makes sure the event runs smoothly. And I, and there's usually a few employees, you know, and I just, it's so hard to imagine that nobody saw the fall or if people saw it, they just kind of let it go and, and didn't do anything. Um, well, the, 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 think about the worst case scenario here, uh, Loretta, and the tragedy that, that could have happened. We're fortunate that, that nobody was killed yet. I just don't get this. Like, the referee, the, 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 the athletic commission. I mean, so who do, you, who do you blame besides everybody here? How does his own corner allow this to happen? And as you wrote so eloquently as well, his corner went out to bitch at the referee. Like, they weren't even concerned about their fighter. Like, are these guys so worried about we're not going to get our 300 bucks that the fighter owes us? Like, like how, I just, it's mind-blowing to me, Loretta, that this could happen. That the, the State Athletic Commission had to have four or five cronies there. You know, the, 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 the doctor had to be there. The corner men there. The, the referee there. It just seems almost impossible that so many people could allow this to happen. Yeah, and don't forget, there, there was supposed to be a corner inspector, and there wasn't. There was no corner inspector. At, at the... If, if all else failed, you know, the referee made the wrong decision because he did see the fall. I analyzed the tape very carefully. He saw the fall and he saw, he watched the corner man pick him, 
back up and put him on the stool. So he's negligent right there. He should have immediately stopped the fight and didn't. Uh, the doctor could, like I said, if the doctor missed it, came in, no one told him the guy had fallen off the stool. I mean, it's a possibility. Uh, and, and so he didn't check him adequately. That That's, that that's you know, not great, but I can understand it happening if he just missed it altogether. Um, but, it, you know, all else fails. There's supposed to be a corner inspector there watching you know, the fighter in the corner, usually the inspector's there to make sure that, you know, there's no funny business, that there's nothing being put on the glove. How about there's the promoters in RFA? In the but the inspector is there to to watch the fighter. <laughs> and, the you know, for an inspector not to be in the corner while the two uh, cage, uh, the two corner men were arguing with the referee is just, it's outrageous. How about and how, how about the company themselves, the promotion and RFA? Don't they deserve some of the responsibility here as well to be watching this and and say, I don't care. This is to the point where somebody has to, you know, unorthodoxly sort of step in and say, I don't care. I'm stopping this personally. We're not doing this. If I'm Mark Cuban, uh, I, this is the last thing I want on my network. You know, think about the lawsuits and, and just everything. Like, I, if I'm Cuban, I'm, I'm calling RFA in. I'm tearing everybody a new one here, Loretta. Well, I, I, I think going ahead, I, RFA should reconsider if they want to have fights in Wyoming. It's a very young commission. Uh, as I stated in the article, ABC president Tim Lukanoff, who knows all the commissions and, and knows their experience, so they have a whole database which tells them. He said they've, they've promoted under 30 fights in the last couple of years. Um, I think it was formed in 2012, from what I saw on their website, that this commission was approved. So this wasn't a commission that came out of thin air. There was no commission. You know, this was formed. So uh, I think it might even be less than three years that they have been uh, working and, and less than 30 events. I mean, they just don't have the experience. So I, I think fight promotions should be very weary. I, I you know, I hate to say that. I, I don't want to, you know, but I, I, I also think Wyoming deserves it. They did an awful job. And, you know, we keep saying we're, they're lucky. I, I, I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop. You know, I was talking to Sherry Wilkin, the ABC medical chair. She uh, helped with the article on the medical side. And she was asking last night, do you know if this guy got tested after the show? Is he okay? You know, because... This could be something, you know, we're out of the blue two weeks later, you know, he passes out again. We don't know what happened to him. We don't know why he passed out the way he did. It could have been neurological. It could have been cardiac. We don't know. Like she said, there are tons of reasons why he could have uh, gone unconscious like he did. And, and she was very concerned. And, you know, I'm hoping he did get the medical care afterwards or he goes and gets it himself, you know. There was a reason that he passed out the way he did, and, uh, you know, I, I hope in his personal life they, they take a look at that and make sure he's okay. Do you think, uh, Loretta, and you've been covering this sport for a long time, um, do you think that we arrive at the point, is there going to be the sort of the NFL moment in which we've seen, and we see it now with the National Hockey League as well, there's been suicides. I don't think, you know, it's sort of like global warming. People, oh, you don't know, and... I think that I think we do know uh, that that extreme brain trauma does lead to to depression, to to potential suicide, and to to a lot of things. But that's not stating. I'm not stating. Oh, you know, the, the shut down fighting and all oh, the evil promoters. Everyone's to blame. I'm just asking a question that has to be asked here. Or I think it'd be naive us to believe. Are you are you worried, Loretta? You know, you're around fighters that you've seen. You know, are you worried that when I speak to this fighter 10 years from now, what he's going to be like? Do you think there's going to be an onslaught of potential issues of brain trauma? Uh, it's, sometimes I talk to fighters and and they're slurred and you, you could tell something's off from the last time you've talked to them. And, I, yeah, I am concerned. Uh, and, I, yeah, I do. I think as the sport gets older, it's only 20 years old in this country, you know, now that the sport's being documented like all the other sports, I, I do think we're going to have some issues with, with brain trauma, for sure. I mean, we've already had some select cases. Um, you know, Gary Goodbridge came out and said, you know, he absolutely has brain trauma and issues now, memory problems. He was an MMA fighter and a kickboxer, but he, he a lot of his career was MMA. So, 
you know, we have these isolated cases coming out. I, I do expect more for sure. And uh, depression and, and the other um, things you talked about, I, I've already heard, uh, you know, fighters are coming out talking about that now. You know, it's it's coming out a little more into the open. But, um, y- yeah, I mean, it's, it's something on one hand that comes with this sport. You know, you choose to do it, and, and you know that this – you have the potential to get knocked out or, you know, you have sustained brain trauma, you're training, you know, sparring, all that. Um, but these guys choose to do it. You know, they love this sport. They're willing to take that risk. So um, at the end of the day, you know, it's their choice. You but know, in a situation like this where the, where the guy fell over, you know, he, he went out. He, you know, he didn't, he didn't know what was happening. He went out. He gets shook and back awake. He gets put on a stool and he gets sent back out. I mean, something could have happened in that fifth and final round. You know, if he had gotten hit in a certain way or a certain place, it, it could have been an absolute disaster on camera. You know, uh, so in that in this case, we were supposed to. You know, we the sport, the commission, the doctor, everyone around was supposed to protect this fighter when he couldn't protect himself, and it failed. I think probably there's a lot of people out there in which we talked about it earlier with the Justin Red stuff, which it falls on deaf ears. Well, it's not in the UFC. Who cares? Uh, what, uh, what does it matter? It was just RFA in Wyoming on a Friday night. But as you stated, uh, the sport as a whole uh, deserves, oh, yeah. deserves better. Every, everybody, the fighter deserved better. Everybody deserved better uh, than, than that. Uh, but, you know, his own damn corner just spraying him with water and, you know, come on, you know, wake up, let's, you know, get, get your head in the game type of stuff is just mind-blowing uh, to me. But we got to wrap it up uh, here, Loretta. Uh, I always enjoy all your articles on uh, SI.com. I really do look forward to the book, and I look forward to getting uh, Justin Wren back on the program. Uh, great to catch up with you. Thanks for the time, Loretta. Absolutely. I'll make sure you get a copy. There's uh, Loretta Hunt uh, with uh, some uh, pretty interesting stuff, and which really could have been disastrous for mixed martial arts. Think if this guy's in a coma now or something. Think if this guy was in a coma and this happened on Mark Cuban's network. Like, it's just, it's just awful. And his own jerk-off cornerman sending him back out there. I'm one of these old-school guys. Why'd they stop the fight? Come on, man. You know, he, maybe he's going to come back. If you fall off a stool in a bar... They're, they're worried, and they're worried about getting sued. And I don't think RFA should get off on this. We can blame the Wyoming you know, commission. We can blame the referee. We can blame everybody. But I, I guarantee if Dana White sees uh, Cub Swanson fall off a stool face first, he's going to walk up and say, hey, hey, we got a problem here. You know, we got a problem here. It's a complete embarrassment for the sport. I don't, I don't even, I, I was thinking, do I even want to talk about this because it's so embarrassing for the sport? But I want to expose these jackasses. Everybody involved, shame on you. All right, we're done. We're out of time. Thanks to Loretta Hunt and Vince Pichel for joining us on the program. And don't forget to check out the Counter Move, Fight Network, Fantasy Sports Network, Marenzi and Black, $1,000 free roll. Man, that's hard to say. But uh, it's right on the front page. You'll see Marenzi and Black, Fight Network. It's $1,000 split up. It's free. It's fantasy MMA. And I'll tell you what, it's a bloody good time. Other than that, you're on your own. Later. <laughs>